Welcome to this session of the Tread Association's virtual conference. I'm Leo Nuringer, Program Associate at the Tread Association of America. Thank you for joining us today for a 10-year follow-up of youth from the original trial of comprehensive behavioral intervention for ticks. We would like to take this opportunity to thank our conference platinum sponsors, MLX and David Amundsen, our diamond sponsor, Oracle, as well as all our donors and supporters for making this free conference possible. To help us continue to provide educational programming like this, please consider making a donation. Your gift will assist the Tourette Association in continuing to provide critical support and resources to the Tourette syndrome and tick disorder community. Please visit Tourette.org slash donate to make a contribution today. And while you're there, don't miss the TAA's virtual poster session, which will be available for viewing throughout the web our website for one week. In today's session, we would be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You may ask questions or share comments using the question panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player at any time. We will collect your questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. It is my pleasure to announce our presenters, Flint Espo, Jennifer Schild, and Emily Ricketts. And with that, I will hand it off to Flint to begin the presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Flint Espill, and I am a clinical psychologist and assistant professor out at Stanford University. I'm very pleased to um, have the opportunity to share some of the findings from our 10-year follow-up follow with you all today. Um, just a few of my co-authors here who, who helped collect the data and, and run some of the analyses that I'll be talking about today are Dr. Doug Woods, uh, Mr. Jordan Steed, and Dr. McGuire. So huge thank you to them, but also, for those of you who've done research, you know it often takes several villages to uh, raise a research study, so to speak. So these are all of the co-authors and contributors to the study more generally. So even though we'll be talking about different parts of it today, uh, this has been a huge effort over about five years uh, to collect these data, and we're really excited to present them to you today. So just a quick roadmap here. Uh, by the end of the talk, we'll have covered a few things. So first, I'm going to briefly go over the original CBIT trial and some of the outcomes and findings from that trial, then talk a little bit about the rationale and the methods for our 10-year follow-up. Then lastly, uh, focus on the good stuff, the findings on the long-term course of ticks and potential effects of early intervention via CBIT. So let's just jump right in. What is CBIT, or the Comprehensive Behavioral Intervention for Ticks? I imagine many of you out there are familiar with CBIT, but I won't assume that you all know what it is. So briefly, CBIT is a, it's a behavior therapy approach, and it comprises several components. Uh, the first piece uh, that's typically covered in the, uh, the first session is some psychoeducation, or some background on what we know about ticks in Tourette and in terms of onset and course and severity and comorbid disorders or co-occurring disorders such as OCD and ADHD. Uh, it's, it's just a, a lot of background that's really helpful uh, for people who may not have researched it to the extent <laughs> that some of us have. Uh, there's also function-based assessment and interventions, which is a fancy way of saying, let's figure out what things in your life tend to make your ticks worse, and then figure out a way to mitigate or reduce the impact of those things on your ticks. And then, of course, there's habit reversal training, which has been around since the early 1970s. There was a famous paper by Ezra and Nunn that was published in the early 70s where they tried out habit reversal for ticks, and it was later adopted into the full CBIT package. Habit reversal is basically a combination of awareness training or figuring out what your tick signals are, uh, then getting an, uh, an operational definition of your ticks, and then creating competing responses or things that you can do with your body to block ticks when you start to notice some of those tick signals. And then, of course, there's a social support component, which basically involves the people in your environment. So for kids, this is often parents. For adults, it can be significant others. But basically having someone support you in, <coughs> excuse me, in helping you practice um, your competing responses and use those competing responses as needed so they become very um, sort of automatic. Uh, there's also a reward system for the younger kids. Uh, any of you who've done CBIT know that it's a lot of work and it requires practice just like any other skill. And when kids put in effort, we like to, to make sure that that effort is recognized. So there's usually um, an individualized reward system that's created between therapists and families. 
There's also relaxation training piece. And the two relaxation skills that are covered in CBIT are diaphragmatic breathing, which is a way to kind of slow your, your breathing rate down and help you relax, and uh, progressive muscle relaxation, which involves going through different muscle groups and systematically tensing them and relaxing them, which can be really helpful for individuals to relax as well. Uh, standard CBIT when we do the research studies is about eight sessions over 10 weeks. In outpatient non-research settings, this can, of course, vary, so maybe some of you have done CBIT and it was fewer sessions, maybe it was more sessions, but the standard uh, version is about eight sessions over 10 weeks. CBIT is considered a uh, first line treatment by several organizations. Most recently, the American Academy of Neurology came out in 2019 and updated their practice parameters and said basically, yep, yeah, if, you can, if you can access it, uh, which can be a problem, um, CBIT should be the first thing that you try uh, for most people with ticks. There are exceptions to that, of course. Um, and other organizations have, have certainly um, followed suit uh, or, or set the stage for that as well. So, you know, the American Association of Child Adolescent Psychiatry, the Canadian Guidelines, and even the European uh, Tourette Syndrome Treatment Guidelines all recommend CBIT as the, a first line intervention. Uh, why do they do that? Well, because when you look across the research literature, CBIT is the intervention with the most support. And when you look at the treatment effects, they're comparable to medication, but without a lot of the side effects. <laughs> that doesn't mean that CBIT works for everyone or meds work for everyone, but on average, uh, CBIT tends to, to work pretty well uh, for uh, about two thirds of the people who get it. Problem with that though, is we don't really know how long the effects of CBIT last. So in adults, there have been some studies that have followed participants up to six months. And in kids, we've followed um, individuals up to 12 months, so about up to a year, but we don't really know what happens after that. Do people who get better stay better? Do they get worse? Do people who didn't get better get better later? Uh, and we, we really don't know how durable or lasting the effects of CBIT are. We also don't know whether or not early intervention alters the course of ticks. There are uh, a lot of data out there that show that when people get older, their ticks tend to just in general decrease in terms of frequency and impairment. Um, but we don't really know a whole lot about uh, whether or not early intervention via CBIT would, would alter the course of ticks. So that's kind of a, a nice little segue into sort of why we did this study. The first aim of our study was really to determine the long-term course of ticks among youth who receive CBIT. And the second is to explore the potential effects of early intervention. So let's talk about the original CBIT trial. Uh, for those of you who don't read scientific manuscripts, uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick summary here. Uh, the original trial was published by P.S. et al. in 2010. There were 126 youth with ticks, and they were randomly assigned to receive uh, either CBIT or uh, PST which was a psychoeducation and supportive therapy, just kind of general problem solving, talk therapy, but none of the active comp treatment components that are found in CBIT. And uh, kids were followed up to 23 weeks and 36 weeks. In terms of the results, 52.5% uh, responded to CBIT and 18.5% responded to psychoeducation and supportive therapy. And when you looked at the overall changes in tick severity as, as measured by the Yale Global Tick Severity Scale or the YGTSS, which is gonna come up a lot during the presentation today, it's kind of the gold standard for uh, assessing ticks. Uh, if you looked at point reductions, those who received CBIT on average had about a 24.7 point reduction. And those who received the supportive therapy uh, did have a point reduction, and on average, that was about 17.1. So more people in uh, CBIT responded, but some people in, in psychoeducation and supportive therapy responded as well. So 10 years later, we decided to do a follow-up study to try to answer some of these questions about uh, how kids are doing uh, post-CBIT intervention. Uh, and so, the, uh, the study personnel attempted to contact all the original CBIT participants via email, snail mail, social media, you name it. Uh, and the data collection took place at three sites. So the original trial took place at, three, at the, the three sites and the follow-up trial also took place at three sites. So there was Marquette University in Milwaukee, there's UCLA, and then uh, Johns Hopkins and Cornell was the third site. We had some personnel change universities, which happens sometimes, um, but the more the merrier. <laughs> 
We also use blinded evaluators to conduct in-person or Skype assessments. Um, so even before the COVID-19 situation, we were uh, utilizing uh, virtual methods for uh, for assessment. And um, this, this doesn't mean that evaluators were themselves blind. It means that they were blind to treatment condition. So when participants were interviewed at 10-year follow-up, the person doing the interviewing didn't know whether or not the, the participant was originally in CBIT or in the supportive therapy condition because we didn't want to bias their ratings at all. We had a couple primary outcomes that we looked at. The first, again, is the YGTSS, specifically the total tick severity score, which is a score that ranges from zero to 50. Higher scores mean more, more severe presentations. And that score is calculated by looking at the overall number of ticks people have, how often they tick, how intense or strong their ticks are or forceful, how complex or outside of sort of the normal range of you know, vocalization sounds or movements their ticks are, and how much those ticks interfere with their ability to, uh, to, to speak, to converse with others, and to do the things they need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And these ratings were, were made for individuals in terms of how they were doing in the week or so um, before the, the time of their follow-up interview. There's also a total tick impairment score that you can calculate on the YGTSS, which involves uh, looking at how much ticks interfere with someone's interpersonal relationships, the romantic relationships, the relationships with you know, family members, uh, their ability to work or go to school uh, or uh, participate in day-to-day -day activities and so on and so forth. So how much of a problem did the ticks cause for them themselves? And lastly, there was the CGIS, which is the Clinical Global Impression Severity Scale, which is a zero to seven scale. And again, higher numbers mean higher severity. And this is a sort of a global uh, number that's calculated based on how the person's doing uh, overall in terms of you know, their ticks and other things that are going on in their life. So who participated? We were actually able to recruit 80 of the original 126, which is pretty good. And we wanted to make sure that the, the 80 that we collected or the sample that we were able to collect um, wasn't biased in some way. So we wanted to make sure that the uh, demographics uh, of the individuals who participated weren't significantly different than the people who didn't participate, because that would mean that our, our sample may not be representative of the original sample as a whole. So these numbers here are characteristics of all of the youth, uh, all of the youth participants uh, in the original trial at the time of baseline. So when they first came in over 10 years ago to participate, you know, that this these were the percentages who were on tick medications or had OCD or ADHD. This is how old they were on average and so on and so forth. And when we run our fancy statistics and we compare the group who participated to the group who didn't participate, what we find is that there wasn't a significant difference in terms of any of these variables, which is a good thing. So that means that we didn't collect sort of a biased subset of the original 126 or a subset that was somehow uh, different in terms of uh, presentation. Okay, so let's get to the good stuff. So what happened to ticks over time? So if we just look at tick severity from childhood to 10 years, there's three time points here. There's uh, baseline, which is the first column. There's 10 week, and then there's 10 year. So if we look at YGTSS severity scores, we can see that people uh, were less severe when they finished the intervention. And then they were also less severe 10 years later. So we kind of see that natural trajectory that we, we know um, from other studies of tick disorders. And again, this is across the whole sample. So we're not, we're not comparing CBIT to supportive therapy yet. This is the entire uh, 80 group of 80 people. If we look at impairment, we see a similar picture. So we see when people start the study, they're here. And when they finish the study, they're down here. And when we interview them 10 later, they all, they're also down here, which is, which is great. And then of course, CGI severity, uh, it's a smaller scale. So these, these bars aren't as high, obviously, but we see the same trend. We see the decrease. Um, for, those of, so as re, for those of you who are researchers, we did control for other variables here, um, such as medication, receiving other interventions, history of treatment, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's get a little more specific <clears throat> and let's look at outcomes by treatment group. So these top two lines are non-responders. So the black line is CBIT non-responders. So people who had CBIT but didn't respond and people who had supportive therapy and didn't respond. These two lines are people who had 
uh, PST and did respond and people who had CBIT and did respond. So if we look at the CGI severity scale, when people first come in for the study, everyone's right about here. At post-treatment, we see the non-responders are up here and the responders are down here. So we see a reduction in tick severity. But what do we see 10 years later? At 10 years later, the people who responded to supportive therapy actually kind of returned a baseline here that they, 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 they got worse in terms of their severity. The people who didn't respond at all kind of stayed in the same area, but the people who received CBIT and responded actually tended to stay better. When we look at the Yale Global Tick Severity, total tick severity score, we see a similar picture. So if you don't respond, you stay up here. And then 10 years later, there is a bit of a reduction. If you do respond to both at post-treatment, we see a reduction, but 10 years later, the people who responded to the supportive intervention actually kind of relapse. So they don't, they don't maintain those, those gains in terms of the, the total tick severity scale, but the people who receive CBIT and responded tend to maintain those gains and stay better in terms of their overall tick severity 10 years later. So what do we learn? Let's, let's just quickly summarize. So what happens if I get CBIT as a kid? Well, if you respond, on average, you tend to maintain those gains. But if you don't respond, you may still see some improvements, but not quite as meaningful. If you, get, uh, if you don't get CBIT, maybe you get supportive therapy or uh, maybe some other intervention, um, you tend to not maintain those gains, even if you do respond. And if you don't respond, you end up about as well as, as those who did. But we also remember, we also have tick impairment. So if we look at tick impairment, we tend to see uh, a pretty interesting picture. So everybody, when they first start the study are up here, ticks are causing lots of problems. That's why they come in for help. Uh, and then if you do respond to either CBIT or uh, psychoeducation and supportive therapy, we see a pretty big reduction here in terms of impairment, much greater than uh, if you don't respond, there's still a reduction. And then 10 years later, guess what? everybody kind of ends up in the same spot. These, these numbers aren't significantly different from one another. So in terms of impairment, we do see that picture where over time, the ticks cause less problems for most people. But if you respond to uh, CBIT, you tend to um, stay, stay low in terms of the impairment. So let's, let's summarize here. So if you respond to treatment, your tick impairment is reduced and may 10 years later. So it doesn't matter if you receive CBIT or supportive intervention, uh, or supportive therapy, early intervention really is key. If you don't respond, your tick impairment is not quite as reduced, but you eventually end up in the same place as responders. So effective treatment, regardless of whether it's sort of CBIT or supportive therapy, may reduce impairment more, more rapidly. And for those of you who have ticks, you know, think about when you were younger, uh, if your impairment could have been reduced earlier, uh, it probably would have um, created uh, far, far less problems for you. So just to summarize, um, this is the longest follow-up study of a treatment sample of use with tick disorders ever conducted, and early CBIT intervention appears warranted and valuable in terms of both reducing tick severity and impairment and maintaining. Some limitations, a lot of these kids were pretty young at study entry, and so when we're asking them questions, about when they were in the study and then afterward, um, their ability to recall some of these events may be questionable. You know, 80 is a pretty good sample size, but in the larger scheme of research, it is considered a, a smaller sample size. It's also not a prospective design. We didn't follow these kids over time. We sort of brought them in later and then asked them to retrospectively recall the information. And there are obviously some next steps that need to occur. So we need to figure out what variables or characteristics might predict long-term outcome. Uh, we really need to increase access to CBIT. Not everyone can get CBIT. It's hard to, to find providers in a lot of areas of the country and the world. And uh, really systematic perspective studies of both behavioral interventions like CBIT and medication uh, are also needed. So uh, we as researchers need to continue to conduct research in, in a similar vein. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Ricketts for the next presentation. Thank you. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Emily Ricketts. I'm clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at UCLA. 
and I will be discussing pretreatment predictors of long-term tick severity and tick-related impairment um, in youth with Tourette syndrome. And okay, there we go. Um, so as uh, Dr. Espel already mentioned, CBIT is recommended as a first-line intervention for ticks. However, we do know that not everyone who receives CBIT um, benefits substantially from the treatment. Um, and for this reason, understanding the factors that are associated with uh, differences in treatment outcome um, is important. And you know, this information can help us make modifications to boost treatment outcome. Um, so there have been a, a couple prior studies that have um, examined clinical characteristics that are predictive of behavior therapy for tick outcomes. And so um, one of these studies combined adult and child participants from CBIT trials. Um, another examined, um, another was a, a trial looking at, I guess, group and individual um, behavior therapy for ticks involving both CBIT and you know, a different type of behavior therapy, which was exposure and response prevention. Um, but ultimately, uh, together, these studies really show that uh, higher pretreatment tick severity um, is associated with greater tick reduction over time. Um, the presence of pretreatment anxiety disorders and also higher premonitory urge severity uh, predicted lower tick reduction and, um, you know, in terms of premonitory urges, so those are those bodily sensations um, that are felt prior to ticking um, and may or may not be relieved upon ticking. And um, and also reductions in premonitory urges over, over the course of treatment and also uh, reductions in beliefs about the need to tick in response to bodily sensations predicted reduced impairment. Um, as well. So this is just a, a summary of what was found in these two studies. Um, but it's, you know, it's also important to understand the factors that are, that influence uh, the course of tick-related symptoms over the long term, um, because, you know, we know that for, for some people, ticks can, um, you know, lessen over time as they age, but, but not for everybody. And so it's important to understand these factors too. Um, and in terms of research examining longitudinal tick outcomes, uh, we see that some of these factors um, are that predict outcomes are really tick severity, um, being female, which is associated uh, often with a, a worsening tick course, um, having a poor emotional and social functioning in childhood. Um, is predictive of poor outcomes as an adult, also having um, co-occurring psychiatric disorders um, like ADHD, um, sometimes OCD, and also the types of ticks that um, a child presents with as well um, influence outcomes over time. So um, presenting with ticks like, uh, you know, lower ticks of the lower um, extremities or lower limbs, um, sometimes coprolalia, uh, more complex ticks. And so our aim here was to really evaluate the pretreatment factors in CBIT that predict tick severity and tick-related impairment outcomes um, across the CBIT trial and 10-year follow-up. And so these are the predictors so that we had selected based on prior literature. So um, sex, being male or female, being on or off tick medication, on or off stimulant medication, uh, parent rated tick severity, um, the presence or absence of a lower limb tick, premonitory urge severity, having a co-occurring psychiatric disorder or not, um, externalizing symptoms. So this is referring to behaviors that are really directed outwardly to the external environment. So things like physical aggression, um, you know, destroying, destroying things, property, uh, disobeying rules, um, and also family functioning. Um, and in terms of our, our outcomes, so we, you know, we were looking at severity and tick severity and tick-related impairment um, at pretreatment, post 
post CBIT or post treatment, and then also this our 10 year follow up. But we also looked at the change in so tick severity and tick related impairment over time separately. Um, and in all of this, uh, we also made sure to control for the initial treatment group um, that participants were assigned to, um, whether or not they positive, uh, whether or not they uh, positively responded to treatment, and also any treatment that they had received since CBIT. So we we uh, made sure to account for those um, factors as well. Um, so these are the uh, assessment measures that are relevant for this analysis. Again, um, you know, in terms of diagnosis, we use the anxiety disorders interview schedule, which is very common. Um, we use the Yale Global Tick Severity Scale, as as uh, Dr. Espel has previously described. Um, the parent tick questionnaire, uh, which is really our parent rating of tick severity. Um, higher scores indicate worse tick severity. The child behavior checklist, we used a subscale to, a, to examine um, externalizing symptoms. And then um, children rated their own premonitory urges um, and the severity. And then the, the brief family assessment measure, which was for um, functioning. And so higher scores indicated poor family functioning. So um, first, what we did is we entered all of the predictors into um, the same model um, to account so that we could account for the presence of all of them. And um, what we see is that higher tick severity at pretreatment and the presence of a lower limb tick at pretreatment um, predicted higher tick severity at the subsequent um, time points. And then the, when we used a, a different approach, which is backward um, elimination, sometimes called backward selection, where we first enter all of the predictors into a model um, and sub, kind of subtract them one by one um, to get the best model, what we see is that being off of stimulant medication, having higher parent rated tick severity and poorer family functioning are all associated um, with higher tick severity at the subsequent time points. And in other words, you could say, you could think of it as, you know, being on stimulant medication at baseline or pretreatment predicted lower clinician rated tick severity at the time points, if you wanted to think of it that way. Um, so now looking at tick related impairment, um, when we entered all predictors, we see that being female and and having a, a lower limb tick of any kind at pretreatment predicted um, greater tick-related impairment at the um, subsequent time points. Um, when we used backward elimination to get the best model, we actually see that being female, being on tick medication, the presence of a lower limb tick and poor family functioning um, are all predictors of um, higher tick-related impairment. So now um, we switch gears and here, um, as I said before, we are looking at change in tick severity over time. Um, so yeah, the course of tick severity. So what we see here is when we enter all predictors that ha having um, higher pretreatment premonitory urge severity um, is associated with um, lower reduction in tick severity over time. When we use backward elimination to get the best model, we see that having a co-occurring psychiatric disorder is what stands out um, as being associated with less reduction in tick severity over time. And this is just um, this is just a visual. Um, you know, we ultimately the the way that we did the analysis. Um, well, yeah, this is this is ultimately just just to give you a better sense of the course and what you know what I'm describing. So if you you have a co-occurring psychiatric disorder, you know you see that the the line is a little straighter. It's um, there's less reduction. If you don't, it's going you know pretty consistently down. Um, in terms of the pretreatment predictors of um, 
change in tick related impairment what we see is that having a higher externalizing symptoms at pretreatment is predictive of greater reduction in tick related impairment um, and so you know it's it's possible that you know for youth who were who were higher on these kinds of symptoms at pretreatment perhaps they were this was really greatly contributing to impairment during the time of the trial and um, you know, perhaps some of these behaviors did decrease with age, resulting in lower impairment. Um, and then when we looked at the, you know, the best model, we see that it's consistent and it's still that, you know, having higher externalizing symptoms. So, you know, physical aggression, things like disobeying rules, destroying property um, is associated with greater reduction in tick related impairment. And um, although this variable is a continuous variable, this is um, just a split, a median split, just to show you visually um, what's happening. So in terms of the um, implications of this, um, perhaps you know, early intervention for youth with um, high tick severity or who sh um, exhibit lower limb ticks um, at an early age may improve the course of symptoms. Um, you know, and now with treatments like uh, CBIT Jr., um, which have been piloted, uh, you know, this is certainly a possibility. Um, also, you know, family functioning is, you know, should be addressed more directly with behavioral treatment. Um, you know, there are treatments like living with ticks that um, do have, you know, modular uh, components and, you know, do address impairment a little bit more directly. Um, and so it's important to, you know, look into these kinds of treatments a little bit more. Um, we know that, you know, families uh, are strained, you know, not just emotionally, but there, there may be objective strain as well. Um, you know, in terms of uh, finances or, um, you know, work, jobs, and things like that. Um, in addition, we see that, you know, in terms of being on or off stimulant medication, you know, that was a predictor also. Um, prior research has shown that, or suggested that ch having ADHD as a child is a predictor of um, greater future tick severity. Um, so it's, you know, is it possible that stimulant use in childhood is weakening this association based on what we're seeing here? And, you know, I think it's really important to emphasize that we really do need more research on the experiences of women with tick disorders. Um, you know, our, our understanding is um, fairly limited. We do know that um, a few studies have shown that being female is associated with um, a greater likelihood of worsening tick course over time um, and greater impairment relative to males. Um, and other studies have shown that being female is associated with increased emotional disorders in adulthood. Um, so what we're seeing here in this analysis is consistent um, with, with those prior studies. Um, and you know, we also do need to uh, address co-occurring psychiatric disorders and symptoms um, more directly in youth. Um, you know, it's it is possible that they they may be a barrier for some people um, in terms of treatment success. Uh, you know, and I mean, it's also possible that their presence could represent maybe a more treatment resistant form. Of the condition, but it, you know, we don't really know. Um, and thank you. So, um, yep, so now we will hand this off to um, Dr. Jennifer Child. Thanks, Emily. My name is Jennifer Schild. I'm a first year graduate student at Suffolk University. Um, and I'll be presenting on the longitudinal evaluation of psychiatric comorbidity in youth with tick disorders. And I'd also like to thank my mentors and co-authors, Dr. Shannon Bennett and Dr. Matthew Specht. 
So individuals with TRET or tick disorders often have co-occurring or comorbid conditions. One of the most common co-occurring conditions is ADHD, which is present in 50 to 60% of individuals with TS. OCD is also very common with the literature showing around 36 to 50% of individuals having this disorder. And then also depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, and disruptive behavior disorders are also common co-occurring conditions. Children and adults with TS also might have more than one co-occurring condition. So in a 2014 national survey of the diagnosis and treatment of ADHD and Tourette syndrome, children who were diagnosed with Tourette had an average of 3.2 lifetime diagnoses of comorbid disorders. And actually 26.9% had five or more comorbid disorders. And then in an even bigger database, a multi-site international database, of 3,500 individuals with Tourette syndrome, so only 12% had no comorbidities. And comorbidities are important to attend to because they have an impact on quality of life. So comorbidities can exacerbate impairment of disorders. So for instance, if an individual has ADHD and Tourette syndrome, those two conditions can interact to create a cycle of distractibility or difficulty focusing, for example. Research also shows that there's a higher rate and severity of behavioral problems in individuals with comorbid ADHD or OCD. And then also importantly, comorbidities that are left untreated can adversely affect the quality of life and long-term outcomes in individuals with Tourette syndrome. So how do comorbidities change over time? A six-year perspective follow-up study showed that ADHD and OCD do improve significantly, but symptoms still remain impairing and persist over time. And then from the original CBIT trial, acute treatment responders showed that they did have some modest improvement in comorbidity at six-month follow-up, but still little is known about those changes in psychiatric comorbidity over time, and also little is known about the responsiveness of comorbid symptoms to CBIT. So the current longitudinal study evaluates psychiatric comorbidity in this large cohort of Tourette syndrome patients across the typical course of the disorder. For our methods, we had the 80 young adults who had participated in the original CBIT trial, and they completed measures of tick severity and comorbid conditions. So for the tick severity, we use the YGTSS, which you're now familiar with. And then for comorbid conditions, we assess those using the mini international neuropsychiatric interview to determine whether the participant met criteria for a specific comorbid condition. And that's a more structured diagnostic interview. And then for the first few participants who came through the study, they completed the anxiety disorders interview schedule, which is a more semi-structured clinical interview that assesses anxiety and related disorders. We also collected demographic information and we collected medication history and treatment history from the time that they completed the original study to long-term follow-up assessment. For the analyses, we did descriptive analysis to evaluate the frequencies of comorbidities at long-term follow-up. We also conducted correlational analysis to evaluate the relationship between tick severity and the number of comorbidities. And then we conducted a series of t-tests to evaluate the differences in the total number of comorbidities between the participants who were initially assigned to the habit reversal condition or the CBIT condition um, or PSC. T-tests were also used to evaluate differences between treatment responders and non-responders, and then also the differences between the number of comorbidities in the original study versus long-term follow-up. And then finally, the Fisher's exact test was used to evaluate differences in the frequencies of comorbidities between the original trial and long-term follow-up. So for the results, first we established that there were no significant differences in baseline characteristics between those who did and those who did not complete the long-term follow-up assessment as Dr. Espill showed on his slide earlier. And then we also collected information to determine who received any form of treatment or medication from 
the original study to long-term follow-up. And we found that 65.7% received psychotherapy, 57.7% received medication for mental health, and only about 22.9% did not receive any treatment at all. And this is important to keep in mind when interpreting our results. So here you can see the breakdown of the number of comorbidities at long-term follow-up. So here you can see that half of the sample did not have any comorbid conditions at long-term follow-up, and the other half of the sample did have at least one comorbid condition. A paired samples t-test revealed that there were no significant differences in the number of comorbidities between the original trial and long-term follow-up. We did find that the number of comorbidities was positively correlated with tick severity on the YGTSS. In other words, um, more severe ticks was related to a higher number of comorbidities, which is consistent with previous research. And then in this next slide, you can see here our next question. We were interested in evaluating whether there were any differences in the frequency of comorbid conditions between the original study and long-term follow-up. And for this, we used Fisher's exact test. And we found that a uh, significantly lower frequency of social anxiety diagnoses at long-term follow-up with 16.3% of participants with that diagnosis compared to 20% with the diagnosis in the original study. And then the same was found for ADHD where there was a lower uh, rate of ADHD at long-term follow-up than in the original study. And then you can see here in the, in the graph that GAD and OCD also went down, although those, that decrease was not significant. Um, so some common co-occurring conditions do become less prominent. However, there are more mood disorders, some of the anxiety disorders like panic disorder, agoraphobia, um, and also substance use and alcohol use do become more prominent at long-term follow-up. So overall, there is a similar number of comorbidities between the original study and 10 years later. And now for a closer look at the individual comorbidity change. So we found that 13 out of the 19 participants who were originally diagnosed with ADHD lost that diagnosis 10 years later, and five gained the diagnosis. For OCD, 13 out of 15 participants lost that diagnosis at long-term follow-up, and five gained it. For GAD, 17 out of 18 participants lost the diagnosis, whereas six gained the diagnosis. And then for social anxiety, 10 out of 16 participants lost the diagnosis, and seven gained it. So from this, again, we can see that many do lose childhood diagnoses and young adulthood. However, some gain new diagnoses, diagnoses either later in childhood, in adolescence, or as, as young adults. And then in this graph, we looked at the number of comorbidities at long-term follow-up based on the original treatment assignment. So whether the participant was initially assigned to receive CBIT or PSC. Um, so as you can see descriptively from this graph, there's a slightly lower frequency of comorbidities among the HRT or CBIT, um, but there's more ADHD. A t-test showed that there was no significant difference in the number of comorbidities between HRT and PST. So the two study conditions are comparable in terms of, of comorbidities at long-term follow-up. And then in this next graph, we looked at long-term follow-up comorbidities based on the original responder status. So by responder status, I mean responder status to either intervention. So responders to either the CBIT or PST. Um, descriptively, there are slightly fewer alcohol and substance use disorders, also no major depressive disorder among the treatment responders, but there's also slightly fewer other diagnoses among the non-responders, such as the um, GAD and the social anxiety. A t-test also showed that there was no difference in the number of comorbidities between responders and non-responders. So what does this all mean? Ticks and some common co-occurring conditions often do become less prominent with time. Ticks remit with age and this might also be true for some comorbidities 
Furthermore, comorbidities change in ways we'd expect in non-tick patients. For instance, we have more alcohol, we have more substance use, which makes sense at this age, and also social anxiety is more prevalent than OCD. Um, ODD and separation anxiety are no longer prevalent at this age, which is all what we, what we would expect. And so we're seeing that some comorbid conditions do fade, but still others persist and also new ones develop. And that's also supported by our finding that there were no differences in the number of comorbidities between the original trial and long-term follow-up. Um, and in general, the prevalence of comorbid conditions in this sample show how individuals with Tourette syndrome are vulnerable to co-occurring conditions, and these might be undertreated or overlooked when ticks are so salient. In fact, co-occurring conditions may be even more impairing than the ticks themselves and might be more of the focus in young adulthood. So overall, we know that ticks can be addressed with CBIT and that can reduce impairment, but comorbidity should also be addressed with other evidence-based treatments or medications when that's needed. Thank you. Oh, apologies. I hadn't realized I was still needed there. Thank you all for an excellent presentation. We're now going to begin answering questions um, that were submitted during the presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the questions pane in the control pa in your control panel. If we're unable to get to everyone's questions here at the TAA, we have a full-time information referral staff member who can answer your questions as well by emailing support at Tourette.org or calling 1-888-4-TOURETTE. That's 4-T-O-U-R-E-T. Um, it seems we got a bunch of questions about the availability of the slides from this presentation. The slides will not be distributed after the session, but all registrants will receive a recording of this webinar within 24 to 48 hours. Um, one of our questions asks about uh, progressive muscle relaxation and mentions that for some patients, they may be inclined to want to do that constriction repetitively. Can you talk about whether or not PMR has been problematic for your patients? Leo, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, great. So I'll jump in, and um, Dr. Ricketts, feel free to jump in as well. Um, having you know worked with youth and adults with Tourette and ticks, and done CBIT for quite a few years now, um, I can say that it, I, uh, it hasn't come into play much from like an OCD perspective in terms of have, having to compulsively tense a certain number of times or until it feels right. I think the bigger issue with PMR in you know anecdotally at least in in my work has been it's kind of hit or miss so for the people uh that who like it they really like it and for the people who don't like it they just really don't like it and I'm a big fan of um of a there's no such thing as a one size fits all approach and so when I do see it I'll do I'll introduce progressive muscle relaxation but if people with him whom I work kids or adults have other ways that they've found uh, to relax that are really helpful or useful for them, 
I, w I will by no means try to enforce PMR <laughs> upon them or, or force it upon them. I'll say, okay, great. Let's, you know, schedule in this other strategy that you use. Maybe you, you meditate, maybe you do yoga, you know, maybe you do push-ups, you know, whatever it might be that, that helps people relax. And I will be sort of flexibly implement that into the protocol as well. And then there's, you know, on the flip side, there are people who really like progressive muscle relaxation. The only thing that I ask when I'm, when I'm a treatment provider is that people, you know, at least give it the old college try and that they practice it a few times instead of just uh, one and done. And those are more of the experiences that I've had, but I don't know uh, about you, Dr. Ricketts, what, what your experiences have been. Yeah, I, I, I have not, um, experienced uh, the progressive muscle relaxation um, being problematic uh, to date, um, you know, but as Dr. Espel has, has said, you know, in CBIT ultimately we are training both progressive muscle relaxation and the diaphragmatic or relaxed breathing and, you know, people tend to have their preferences as to which ones they prefer to use. Um, I think you know, a lot of people do tend to like doing the relaxed breathing, and it's also um, relevant for as a, a competing response for the vocal tics as well. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, next question is that it would appear that the overall highest severity group in all aspects of the YGTSS tended to be the CBIT non-responders. Is there a chance that CBIT is more effective for those who are mild to moderate than for those who are severe? I mean, I would I would say to a degree that yes, that would be that would be the case. Um, you know, I think, and and often, I mean, for many of the behavioral treatment studies, we we do have a tend to have more of an upper limit um, as to the the severity um, the severity of ticks that uh, participants should have to be included in the, the trial also. Um, so, I mean, I, I would say so. Okay, thank you. Um, there are also a couple questions regarding um, the self, whether or not, the extent to which self-awareness is required to practice CBIT and um, the various components of that. For example, for patients that may have autism spectrum disorder, is there an assessment that you are aware of, or is there something that you do to assess whether or not a patient will be able to learn this protocol? I, I don't know if, if there's one assessment per se that, that we would use, but from a, uh, an awareness perspective, one of the great things about CBIT and the habit reversal contained within is that there is an awareness training component. And so part of what we do in, in treatment is really helping people become more aware of when they're ticking, what their tick signals are, and it's a process. And so um, I would argue that for people who aren't as aware, they're every bit as likely to respond and maybe even gain a little bit more um, from, from the experience itself. Now, I can't speak to the autism spectrum. Uh, it's not an area of my expertise. There are certainly assessments out there like the ADOS, for example, that assess for autism. Um, what I've read about doing CBIT and behavior therapy with, you know, for ticks for individuals with autism is, you know, sometimes you need to potentially go at a slower pace or break things down more or spend more time practicing specific skills. Um, but that's that's the extent uh, of my knowledge uh, in terms of CBIT and autism spectrum. I don't know, Dr. Ricketts, if, uh, if, if you've read anything or uh, had similar experiences. Um, I mean, not with not with autism spectrum, but I mean, just, you know, with awareness, ultimately, we are working to to try to build that. Um, you know, as we work through the ticks and work on each one. So, you know, we we ultimately this is where we're we're asking people to describe um, describe their ticks and and any urges they have before they tick. We have them try to catch their ticks during session. Um, so this is you know these are things that we are actively trying to build as we um, as we do the treatment. So, um, but Thank it's you. yeah. 
Um, unfortunately, this is all the time that we have for this conference session, but I want to thank you all for a wonderful presentation. Once the session is closed, our participants will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would greatly, appreci greatly appreciate if you'd complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of the session. There are continuing education credits available for the session at an additional fee. You can visit Tourette.org for more information and check out the virtual poster session on our website, which you can see on the screen right now. Feel free to copy that link. Um, we encourage you to reach out to us about this virtual conference or for other ideas and suggestions you may have. This presentation was presented free of charge thanks to our generous donors. If you appreciated this session, we welcome you to support the organization. Visit us at Tourette.org to learn more and donate. On behalf of the Tourette Association, thank you again for joining us and taking the time to view our presentation. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Leah.